Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode, I think it's 212. I don't know. It's about Thomas Audley. Audley is one of those figures who's sort of on the periphery of power, showing up here and there, but not really ever getting the full spotlight. And to be fair, it's probably to his benefit. He's one of the few people who had real power at court at this time, who also miraculously managed to die in his own bed at a fairly decent age. Um, So he doesn't always get a lot of attention just on himself. But I've been reading a book on Restoration England, so like a couple generations later, and Audley's name came up in the context of the changing housing landscapes and the changing homes, um, because he, of course, had benefited from a lot of the disillusion and had done a lot of development within London. And this book was talking about kind of the legacy of that. And so I thought that for the purposes of this podcast, I would go back and focus an entire episode on Oddly Alone. But first, you guys, I have, I'm going to give you a teaser. TudorCon 2024 is happening. I haven't made any announcements because it's going to be a little bit different this year than it was in the past. It's at a different location um, in a different state. It's not at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair anymore. I'm super excited about where it is. Um, and so I guess I just want to say, stay tuned. It's going to be at the end of September next year, 2024. It's still on the East Coast. I will be announcing it soon. So stay tuned. I'm going to be putting out a call for speakers soon. And, um, the first thing I'm doing is writing to all of the people who have come to Tudor Cons in the past and giving them first crack at being able to come, uh, because I also have much more limited space. So it's going to be a smaller amount of tickets that I can sell. So I'm going to be reaching out. If you've come to TudorCon in the past, look out for an email from me uh, with the information, and then I will release it more widely. I'm super excited. It's going to be so much fun. So end of September 2024, stay tuned for all of the details on that. How's that for a tease, huh? I bet you're super excited. I bet you are, right? All right. So in a bustling Tudor court where politics, power and intrigue ran rampant, Sir Thomas Audley stands as a figure often overshadowed by the larger than life personalities of Henry VIII and the other leaders of this time. When we first encounter Audley in the narrative, he is seamlessly navigating the treacherous waters of Tudor politics, mingling with figures like Cromwell and more. But he wasn't just a mere spectator. He was a player in the political chess game, orchestrating moves that would shape England's destiny. As Lord Chancellor, his influence was undeniable and his decisions, particularly regarding religious reform, had lasting impacts. Audley's roots trace back to a family of moderate means. He was born in Earl's Colne in Essex around the turn of the 16th century. He was neither of noble birth. He also wasn't poor. He was just kind of right in the middle in this growing middle class that we see in the 16th century. The Audleys were not at the forefront of the nobility, but they did have a certain amount of respectability in their community. And it's crucial to understand this kind of middle class status. It neither guaranteed him a spot in the royal court nor left him entirely out of the realm of opportunity. Instead, it provided Audley with a unique vantage point a drive to elevate his family's name, and the flexibility to navigate the socio-political landscapes of Tudor England. He went to Buckingham College, which is now known as Maudlin College in Cambridge, and here he was exposed to the burgeoning ideas of the Renaissance, steeping himself in the classics and the liberal arts. Cambridge at this time was a crucible of intellectual activity, of Protestantism, The environment was instrumental in honing his analytical and rhetorical skills, tools that would serve him well in the years to come. 
Post Cambridge, like many ambitious young men, he went into law. He joined the esteemed Inner Temple in London. The legal profession was a doorway for middle class young men who were ambitious, this doorway to political influence and power. The Inner Temple was one of the four inns of court. It was not just a place for legal training, it was a nexus of political connections and alliances. As a member, Audley rubbed shoulders with the legal and political elites of the day, laying the groundwork for his eventual ascent to the heights of the Tudor court. His ascent started when he became the town clerk of Colchester. This might seem like a provincial place on the surface. For Audley, though, it was a masterstroke. Colchester was a significant town in Essex. It was a hub of administrative activity, and by becoming its town clerk, He was not only privy to local governance mechanisms, but he also positioned himself as a key player in the region's bureaucratic structures. It honed his administrative acumen and bolstered his reputation as a competent and trustworthy public figure. He also then married a Christina Barnardiston. It was a strategic alliance as well as a romantic one, like all marriages of this class in the 16th century. They were a well-regarded family with substantial land holdings and connections. By aligning himself with the family, he amplified his social capital and widened his sphere of influence. However, it was his appointment as the Justice of the Peace for Essex that truly marked his entrance into the big leagues. To understand its gravity, one must delve into the role's importance in Tudor England. A Justice of the Peace, or a JP, was more than just a legal role. JPs were pillars of local governance, responsible for maintaining law and order, administering local affairs, and representing the monarch's interest. For Essex, a prominent county, having this position was akin to holding the keys to the region's governance. Oddly, with this title, not only gained considerable influence within Essex, but also sent a clear signal to the Tudor court about his rising stature and capabilities. It was this very combination of local prominence and central recognition that laid the groundwork for his future role on the national stage. As his influence grew regionally, so did his national ambitions. Representing Colchester in the House of Commons was a strategic maneuver on his part. The House, during the Tudor era, was an arena of policymaking, power play, and personal alliances. For Audley, this wasn't merely a political position. It was a platform to further his reach and integrate with the influential figures of the realm. His representation showcased his capability to act as a bridge between local interests and the central government, effectively amplifying Colchester's voice in the nation's political discourse. He, at this point, became aligned with Thomas Woolsey. Woolsey was at the height of his power, his vast influence and close association with Henry. He was a monumental figure in the political landscape. Aligning with him was both an advantage and a gamble. For a while, Audley enjoyed the protection and patronage that came with Woolsey's favor. But then Woolsey's dramatic dismissal in 1529 meant that Audley had to navigate a political minefield. Ties to a fallen favorite could be detrimental, but Audley was adept at his political maneuvering, and he was able to sidestep the potential pitfalls and continue his upward trajectory. The role of Lord Chancellor became open and available with Woolsey's fall, and it was the apex of legal and political power. Audley saw himself as a contender to becoming the next Lord Chancellor. But it was at this point that Thomas More was appointed. This wasn't just a personal setback for Audley. It also had broader implications. More was a strong Catholic, and that contrasted with the growing reformist sentiment that was taking over England. His appointment, in many ways, was symbolic of this tussle between the traditionalists and the reformists, this tension that would shape Tudor England and its religious trajectory in the coming years. The next move for Audley was becoming the Speaker of the House of Commons. This position, which was central to the parliamentary system, conferred upon its holder not just ceremonial duties, but immense power and influence. 
As Speaker, Audley was responsible for overseeing parliamentary proceedings, a task that demanded both astute legal knowledge and adept political maneuvering. His appointment signaled the trust of the Tudor establishment. It laid the foundation for his more substantial roles in the impending religious and political upheavals. As Speaker, he oversaw the one of the most consequential pieces of legislation ever, which was the series of acts leading to the break with Rome, and especially around the annulment of Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. This was very high stakes. The very fabric of English religious life and its ties to the papacy were at a crossroads. And Audley was the Speaker of the House of Commons. His involvement and influence in this arena showcased his capacity to navigate these sensitive waters. He shepherded the legislation through his legal expertise, combined with his nuanced understanding of the political moves, ensured that he was central to this seismic shift in ecclesiastical politics. So he shepherded through all of these laws, all of these acts that separated England from Rome and oversaw the divorce with Catherine of Aragon. With all of that under his belt, it was only a matter of time before Audley was elevated to the highest office of the legal realm, which was the Lord Chancellorship. He became the king's right-hand man in matters of justice and administration. His elevation was in many ways symbolic of the evolving nature of Henry's politics, a move from traditional religious alliances to a more independent and centralized English monarchy. Audley's tenure as Lord Chancellor underlined the delicate balance of power, faith, and ambition during one of England's most transformative epochs. The political climate was rife with tension at this point, and it all kind of came to a head under the Act of Supremacy in 1534. Leading up to this legislation, the impasse between Henry and the papacy over the annulment of his marriage to Catherine had intensified. Henry, driven by both personal desires and political considerations, wanted, of course, to be the head of an autonomous English church, free from the constraints of the papacy. This was encapsulated in the Act of Supremacy, which proclaimed Henry as the supreme head of the Church of England. The ramifications were profound. Every subject was now compelled to acknowledge not just the king's temporal power, but also his spiritual authority. Refusing the Oath of Supremacy, which affirmed this act, had dire consequences. Two towering figures of English Catholicism, Sir Thomas More and John Fisher, stood in opposition. Moore, the former Lord Chancellor and one of England's most revered thinkers, and Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, both declined the oath. Their refusal became emblematic of the ultimate price of conscience in this new order. Both were executed and their deaths resonated deeply. Audley, by this time becoming an influential figure in the administration, worked closely with Thomas Cromwell and Richard Rich. This trio, unified in their allegiance to Henry and the newly reformed church, were instrumental in implementing the king's policies against the Roman church. Oddly, using his legal acumen, was central in drafting and executing the legal frameworks that would dismantle Catholic influence. His role in tandem with Cromwell and Rich underscored the calculated and relentless march of the Tudor regime away from Rome, reshaping English religious and political landscapes forever. One of the most significant undertakings in the Henrican Reformation was the dissolution of the monasteries. Cromwell was Henry's principal secretary, later appointed vicar general, spearheaded this audacious initiative. Recognizing the vast wealth and resources that the monastic institutions held, Cromwell commissioned a survey in 1535 known as the Valor Ecclesiasticus, which I actually did a YouTube video on over the summer, so I'll try to find that to link to it in the show notes. This comprehensive inventory meticulously chronicled the incomes and assets of religious houses, revealing their considerable affluence. The subsequent decision to dissolve these monastic establishments was not merely a religious undertaking. It was profound profoundly economical and political. The crown was grappling with financial strains. Henry had, of course, inherited a vast amount of wealth from his father, spent it all making war in France, uh, among other things, and the revenues from the monasteries presented a solution to to that problem. 
These religious houses, also with their loyalties to the papacy, were seen as potential bastions of resistance against the newly established Church of England. So how does this bring Audley into the picture? Well, he was ever the pragmatic statesman, and he saw opportunities in the midst of this upheaval. As the monasteries were disbanded, their vast tracts of lands and assets were redistributed. And I just have to go off on a Monty Python tangent here because I just said vast tracts of land, um, which, of course, has me then say, she's got a huge vast tracts of land. One day, lad, all this will be yours. What, the curtains? No, not the curtains. I can't do an episode without going into Monty Python. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go onto YouTube and look up Monty Python huge tracks. Just see what comes up. All right. So we had the little required Monty Python break. So, oddly, was among the beneficiaries of this redistribution. He acquired lands and vast tracts of lands and assets from several dissolved religious institutions. I have so much fun, guys. I have so much fun. Vast tracts of lands and assets from several dissolved religious institutions, notably enhancing his wealth and consolidating his position among the Tudor elite. The disillusion was financially and politically expedient for the crown. Figures like oddly marked the end of this millennia-old tradition for England, reshaping its spiritual, cultural, economic landscape. And Sir Thomas Audley continued to rise. His ascendancy was nothing short of meteoric. Yet with prominence came scrutiny. Foreign ambassadors, particularly those from Catholic nations, often viewed Audley with a measure of disdain, deeming him an emblem of the new England, one that had severed its time-honored ties with Rome. Their dispatches back home sometimes painted oddly as a self-serving opportunist, more beholden to personal advancement than to any lofty principles of justice. Yet, from Henry VIII's perspective, figures like oddly were indispensable. These, they called them baseborn officials, not tied down by the long-standing aristocratic norms and loyalties, brought a refreshing blend of pragmatism and loyalty to the crown. Their rise from obscurity meant that their fortunes were deeply intertwined with the favor of the king, making them ardently committed to the crown's cause. So, of course, we can't talk about this period without bringing in Anne Boleyn's downfall. Her relationship with Henry changed the course of English history, um, but by 1536, the once fervent passion between Anne and Henry had cooled, and she found herself ensnared in a web of conspiracies and betrayals. The trial, of course, was a spectacle of the highest order. Thomas Audley, as Lord Chancellor, played a pivotal role. He presided over the proceedings, which were, of course, more theater than justice. Under intense pressure and amidst the climate of fear, the accused were inevitably found guilty. In this tumultuous period in his life, Audley's involvement further solidified his position as one of the key players in Henry's court demonstrating his unwavering loyalty to the king, even when faced with this set of circumstances. As the tumultuous 1530s drew to a close, Audley's stature only continued to grow. In recognition of his steadfast service to the crown, he was elevated to the peerage in 1540 as Baron Audley of Walden, marking a symbolic ascension from his modest beginnings to the highest pinnacles of English nobility. Around this period, he entered into a second marriage with Elizabeth Gray. Of course, the Gray family had, was upper class, had nobility. Marrying into the family not only solidified Audley's place among the upper echelons, but also intertwined his fate with one of England's highest ranking families. After the downfall of Thomas Cromwell, Audley's role in the 1540 Parliament became even more prominent. He was navigating the choppy waters of post-Cromwellian politics, and he remained a confidant of Henry VIII somehow. A testament to this was his involvement in the Thomas Fiennes trial of 1541. Fiennes was the ninth Baron Dacker tried for murder, a charge stemming from a violent poaching incident. Oddly presided over this high-profile trial, and in a surprising verdict, given the noble status of Fiennes, 
He was found guilty and executed, underscoring Audley's commitment to the rule of law, regardless of one's status, so he said. So Sir Thomas Audley's life was emblematic of a transformative era in English history. Through sheer ambition, acumen, adaptability, he maneuvered the perilous corridors of Tudor politics. And when he died in 1544 of natural causes in his own bed, which is amazing for somebody of his stature, he left an indelible mark on the legal and political landscape. Whether facilitating the royal divorce, overseeing the dissolution of the monasteries, or codifying new laws, he was invariably at the heart of pivotal moments. His legacy, however, is one of contrast. To some, he is remembered as an unyielding servant of the crown, instrumental in realigning England's religious and political compass. To others, he is a symbol of opportunism, benefiting from the upheavals of his time. Either way, we can't help but marvel at his journey from a humble lawyer to Lord Chancellor of England. So that is it for this week. Remember to stay tuned for info on TudorCon 2024. It's going to be back and better than ever. <laughs> Let me know what you thought about this episode. You can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016 Tesco. That's 801 683 9756. Or join the Tudor Learning Circle, which is a free social network just for Tudor history nerds. There's a book club, all kinds of good stuff that goes on there. Thank you so much for listening, and I will talk with you soon. <laughs> Bye. Blow, northern wind, a sandal may be sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. I caught a board in Bowerbreak, that's all his on sea. Men's full maiden of me.